the whole idea about entrepreneurship is like it teaches you so much to handle no where did the idea come from how was that how was it formed we pay a lot mm. for his underwear sorry if i name drop there but it doesn't fit what's it been like for you sort of navigating the competitor landscape we can be better to really take the market share of the big dominated mm. brands how did you actually test the demand for the product and it broke the record in the uk so that's product market fit sorted yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> <laughs> what kind of gave you the conviction to follow that through yeah that is a well it's a big question. It's a really <laughs> yeah. big question, yeah. yeah. I've noticed sustainability is quite a big part of your brand. We live it in a world that is so cheap, so easy to create any product. I see the kind of first hands of negative impact of growing unsustainable crops. What's been some of the, the hardest moments of the business? I was given seven days notice to leave the country. I was actually leaving in my office for a while. How did you sort that? I left. I have to dismiss the whole team. I put everything I have into a storage, hoping that I will be able to find another visa to come back. So how did you pick the business up from nothing? I have never told anyone yet. Thanks for coming on. It's, it's really good to, to finally meet you and, and have a chat. Um, I suppose just for the benefit of the audience, can you just give us a bit of an idea of, obviously people know you for being you know, the, fa the founder, um, but do you mind just giving us a bit of an idea of sort of what you were doing um, beforehand? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started a company called Justwares. We are a direct-to-consumer brand creating the most comfortable un underwear for yeah. men. Yeah, uh, with an interesting strap line as well, I saw. <laughs> Do you want to just do you want to share what your strap line is for the business? There's quite a few. Palace oh, are there? For the phallus. Okay, fine. That's one. That is a painter. Palace for, for the phallus. phallus. Yeah, that I is love one. that. Yeah. yeah, and I think the underwear your balls deserve. I think was the other one, wasn't it? Oh yeah. That's that, another that one. is actually the first one I come up with. Is it okay? Um, so the difference, it's not just an underwear, right? Yeah. Um, it's actually an underwear. It's a pouch underwear. Okay. There was no one was doing that in the market before before we come up with the idea, and. We think about okay, what is pouch? How do we expand the pouch? And it's like, oh, it's like a, it's like a palace for your crown jewel. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And starting from there, we're playing around, uh, and eventually it's like, oh, actually, palace for your pal palace for your phallus is, is so much better and yeah. so punchy. Yeah, yeah. And another one is uh, our brand mission is be humble, but okay. have balls. Yeah, yeah. Like everything about balls jokes, we can go out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. So there's never ever an awkward moment in the office yeah. then, basically. No. Just Nothing like inappropriate. Say, as a comedian, this is already going to be the hardest podcast <laughs> I've ever well, <laughs> I'm going to have to work so hard <laughs> to not <laughs> to take this seriously. Yeah. It's amazing. At the Honest. end, all I want you is your balls with thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. And then at the end of it, then, exactly. Then it's a win, right? I'll say then that. It's a win. Um, okay. So I suppose before you before you started Just Wears, I mean, where did the where did the idea come from? How was the how was it formed? Yeah. So I was working as an investor uh, at a venture capital fund, and we have seen quite a lot of few people, well, quite a lot like startup funder coming yeah. to pitching the ideas. And in that process, I just really hungry to start a business because. Uh, I was always in the position of seeing this brilliant idea yeah. flying around um, and one day like, what can I, I want to join their league mm. rather than sitting here. And then it was quite funny opportunity because uh, my partner at that time working in finance and he his working hour is crazy, averagely 10 to 12 hours. And when every time we go on a date, it's right after his work. Yeah, right? yeah. And the first thing I see him and he will just like stand up and uh, stretch readjust the underwear yeah. you probably are doing that you just didn't realize that yeah that yeah, yeah. awkward readjustment is the first thing i said well can you stop doing that and he said well my underwear just sucks we pay a lot mm. for his like common client underwear sorry if i name drop there no, no, no that's fine but it doesn't fit yeah, and yeah. Also, he asked me well if you don't like my underwear then go to buy something for me, yeah. stop complaining. Typical conversation, right? <laughs> so I started shopping around and the product I found in the market either made from cotton with no design, just uh, white front, doesn't fit really okay. well. It chafe, yeah. like it rides up and the guys have to readjust all the time. Or oh, they're made of synthetic fabric, like a, a lost boost plan are made of that. Yeah. And they are completely uh, polluting for the environment. So I thought, well, why can there be a middle ground of underwear that not only 
made of sustainable materials and also have a better design. Mm. And when men wear it, they genuinely look good. Yeah. And that's the whole idea when we come up when Just Wear's idea was born. Okay. Yeah. And so how did you take that? Sort of, and it's always a question we ask on every single interview. But how did you take that first step? Of you know, you, you're on the date, obviously, with 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 your partner at the time, and uh, you realize that there could be a gap in the market for the, for that yeah. product. How did you then try and put that into place and take it to the next level? Well, coming down to like, well, it's crazy, right? When you think about, oh, a girl is re-innovating men's underwear. How much do you know about? Men's balls. Yeah, that would be my first, my first question. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, yeah, as, it's true. As a, as a female, it must be hard to actually un- understand kind of what fits, what doesn't, and how that and how that works. Is that fair to say? Uh, but I'm the one who judge if that look good or not. Okay. Right. True. That is true. Yeah, yeah that is true. Right. So I probably have a good tell yeah, when yeah. it yeah, looks yeah. good and when doesn't. Yeah. So that is kind of an instant feeling of like a okay, we can do something here, but. I don't want to be a crazy idea. So what I did as a first step is, um, because my job at that time, I still working in VC, I still like have a lot of opportunity chatting with like different founders. Yeah. I tend to buy them quite a lot of drinks and then we just go, like you do this kind of product like concept development and I just run through the idea with them to say, uh, do you have sweaty balls? Okay. <laughs> that would be my first yeah. co- question yeah, yeah, with yeah. them. They say, what are you talking about? So let's have a couple of drinks. Let's yeah, get yeah. down to that. And eventually this actually leading to uh, pretty much, I spoke to probably around the 200 men at the list. Okay. And to really understand what do they feel, uh, what could be better and what are they not feeling comfortable with their current product line yeah. and what brand they wear. And uh, if they could have done one thing to change what their underwear yeah, yeah, yeah. is, yeah. what would that be? It all coming back to the same problem is my underwear doesn't fit, yeah, yeah, it yeah. chafes, yeah, it yeah. rises up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so that, so that was the, the product research, if you like. That, that's, that, that's what made you realize actually, yeah, there is a there could be a demand for that. Yeah, for that absolutely. Product. And also it's not really, like when you have like casual conversation with, pe- with friends and yeah. people generally, uh, you realize it's quite awkward conversation to have if yeah, it is. in an yeah, official yeah. situation. You yeah. would not go to a restaurant to tell other people, no. hey, I chafe, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you be would be so honest one. after a couple of yeah. points yeah, and yeah. then that is where the problem is. Yeah, yeah. I always think like uh, any business, whether it's technical or not, it has to solve a real problem. And the problem is not artificially in cre- mm. created everyone if you dive deeper you will find the core yeah. of the problem i'm with you and so how did you then once you realize that there could be a demand for that product how did you actually test the demand for the product because we've had a couple of people come on when they do the product market fit experiment yeah some have come up with really good ideas of um kind of uh, google seo and, and and that sort of thing to actually understand what traffic you could get from keywords yeah um how did you go about actually finding product market fit well, at that time, the first thing I did is I created a landing page and that landing page has a hand drawing uh, underwear outline sketch, which look ugly now <laughs> looking back. And I just created like had a highlight of the key unique selling points and the, what I'm trying to do. And just say, if you are interested in following my journey, yeah. then uh, signed up here, right? So that is kind of a landing page. Now you call that lead generation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's basically what I did as a first step. I shared there with all my friends, family, and uh, uh, people I spoke to like uh, in a coffee shop or in a bar. And at that time, I spent so much time talking to the bar attendant, mm-hmm. uh, trying to really, because their, their job nature is, they're gonna stand behind the bar for at least eight hours per yeah. night, yeah. right? And uh, uh, they move around a lot. They're actually perfect demographic in terms of thinking about who would the most benefit from yeah. the product I created. Mm. And I just sent to all of them. And these people actually, funny enough, even though I'm, I wasn't friend with them, they're completely stranger. When we launched the Kickstarter campaign, which is the next step I did okay. uh, to validate the idea, they become such a strong advocator for the brand because they enjoyed the conversation I had mm. with them. They enjoyed the uh, the. The, the product in general. Okay. Yeah. And, and so obviously you mentioned Kickstarter, which I think is quite a unique way of going about it. We've never had a founder before that's gone through no. Kickstarter. No. Oh, really? Yeah. So I find that really cool. So what, what, take me through that. What made you want to go, go via Kickstarter? Um, so I did a Kickstarter campaign actually too before this business, but for another, for, for my previous job. And they all went really successfully. 
Um, so I already have experience with um, Kickstarter crowdfunding. Uh, around that time, this project was not set it up to be a, I didn't intend to be a full-time job. Mm. I was just trying to validate the idea to see if this could be my side project. And Kickstarter tend to be uh, the best way to test if your idea has a, can gain some momentum, yeah. can be well perceived and well received by a wider audience. And Kickstarter is the largest product base crowdfunding platform in the world. They have over millions like users across the whole world. Uh, there's no other cheaper way than putting your idea out there to let other people judge it. Mm. And what was the response like when you first uh, launched Kickstarter campaign? We become the most back to the power project in the UK after oh, wow. 30 days. Wow. And it broke the record in the UK. So that's product market fit sorted. Yeah. <laughs> <I think laughs> that's, that's covered. Yeah. Men, okay. Men's balls were crying yeah, out exactly. across the nation. Yeah, exactly. That's great. And, and how did you, is it a case of like, you just put it on Kickstarter and then it just does its thing? Or did you have to promote the Kickstarter? Yeah, we, it took me probably 10 months to prepping uh, for that campaign. That includes a lot of things from marketing to early users, like beta, like beta testing or mm. alpha testing, uh, be very precisely. So we, in that process, I was doing concept development and sampling, and also sorting out of like manufacturer supply chain to try to get that minimum order done. And what I initially set up the goal is, uh, I think it's 20k or maybe 15,000 pound so that I can get, I can create the first uh, minimum order quantity with okay. the manufacturer. And it ended up, we got in total probably almost over 150,000 uh, pound of pre-orders. Wow. Uh, from 63 countries across the world. 63? Yeah. And you haven't made a single pair of underwear at this point? No. That's insane. Not that. I made the samples, yeah. but never commercialized. Sure. Um, that's another thing is that I'm in that process, I probably made over 60 samples. That's a lot of samples. Mm. I'm so obsessed into mm. product because I really, really believe if you want to create a really good brand, you not only, the first thing you have to crack the code is you need to have amazing product that yeah. outperform other companies competitors sure no definitely no definitely so if somebody was listening to this and they have an idea for a business and they're thinking of going through kickstarter as a as a way to get it going what yeah. would be your advice to somebody well specifically for kickstarter well first they have to be a product-based business it can be uh, underwear can be a sneaker can be a cooler uh yeah. and can be a card actually has to be physical product and second my i think the secret sauce for us to get successful is creating that mailing list, generating a really growing, pumping up people's ex excitement mm. in advance about the product and then turning these people into your brand advocate. Because at that time we did every single friends or people on the mailing list. All I want them to do is, can you tell two of your friends? Yeah. Mm. yeah. And think about the compound impact. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah it kind of explodes from that. I was going to ask, how do you, um, how do you, do you have any sort of ideas as to, to how to engage people from a mailing list when it's a product that's more practical than enjoyment based? Meaning once people, people, no one likes uncomfortable underwear. Mm -hmm. And then once they have comfortable underwear, they go, oh my God, I found the best underwear company. That's what, but then they're like, I'm sorted now. I that's know exactly I get my... how so, our customer journey is. Yeah. So how do they go? Because if I then, I, I don't know if I would, you know, if I had like um, a lamp that I needed to light my room and I was looking for the best lamp that fit my room. Once I bought the lamp, I don't know if I'd necessarily want to hear from a lamp company mm. repeatedly. And to, to do that's quite impressive. So what do you think is the kind of strategy there? So there's a two things here. There is a difference between a necessary product that people buy all the time versus a necessary product people just buy once and then never come back. Mm. Like take example, you may buy your bedding sheet. You probably want the most comfortable bedding sheet. Right. But once you buy a pillow, once you buy a set of bedding sheet, when was the last time you buy another one? Yeah. Yeah. Like they're necessary, but not frequent enough. And the, you think about toilet paper or underwear. Do you change your underwear every day? I hope so. Hmm. So that means you need at least seven pairs to cover the whole hmm. week. Oh, I thought you meant, do I buy new underwear every day? And you were like, I hope so. And I was like, I'm on made of money. That's, <laughs> that's insane. Get your hand in your pocket. Do right? you change? Like yeah. Jeff Bezos. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. No, that's, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a valid point. It is, as you say, it's a, it's a product that you do 
you need more than one of and it's a repeat it's a repeat purchase isn't it you have to see yeah the frequency the use frequency yeah. of the nature of the business yeah and just on that i mean how out of interest how frequently are people repurchasing underwear our our repeat purchase is a secret source of the business okay. it really the core drive of the growth because uh, we have once people feel our product, once people put it on that product, yeah, they yeah. can they feel it immediately. They just feel how soft mm. the product is, and then when they put it on, our design lift up your bum, yeah, yeah. and they make your package just look better, yeah, yeah. And that is immediate um, impact as a user, whether you're a man who wear it mm. or a woman who Sees it. look at it. Yeah, it's just an enjoyment. Yeah. I love the honesty. I mean, that's oh, so, yeah, no, it is. That's it's just great. Very, it's a very never heard an underwear no. like business owner say like pulls your butt up and makes your dick bigger. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's what that's what it make. That's what it does. Right. That's so cool. Were you always quite direct with kind I'm of not advertisement that by the way? <laughs> no, 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 no. Of course. But as in, like, were you were you always quite um, sort of direct and like interesting with like the guerrilla marketing side of it? Because like like with the with the phrases and the slogans you're using earlier and things like that, mm. like past, were you always like was that the approach you always had in your mind to take for the company? Like let's make it fun. Let's make it kind of modern. Yeah. So I always want to do something different like i want just wear to be a challenging brand to be a challenging brand you have to do something differently mm. right like coming down to be humble but have balls it's not just playing around like balls jokes it's really a reflection of me as a founder how i perceive life mm. like i want to keep humble attitude but really have the courage really have the balls to do something different yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, it's not. So I only learned the guerrilla marketing until I start after I started the company. Right. And right. then people start to call us like, "Oh, you guys are doing guerrilla marketing." Before I even know the concept. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So with it's the quite um, flattering. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No. I mean, it's it's really impressive. Um. So with the with the samples, I think a lot of people's thought is, you know, maybe they have an idea for, a, as you said, a sneaker or or a top or a hat, whatever mm. it might be, and they go, "I think I could do that better," but. If I think about that, I think I have a l absolutely no idea how I would go about getting a custom thing made. There's print on demand, for example, for things mm. like putting a logo onto a template and then they'll send it. But to actually like get a custom fashion design made for a new piece of fashion, I have no idea how you go about that. So if, if someone's listening at home and they might have a fashion business in mind, how do you do that? So I did something, maybe it would be helpful. Um, I never come from a design background. So I never know how to design stuff. And in that process, to be able to speak to the manufacturer and appealing me, appealing as a, come across as a pro, I did the academy, like a design course. It's okay. literally a month crash course. Uh, you pay, I think around that time is like $250. Someone put together the content and just so I can study. Uh, Was that I, a sort of home study? Or was it actually like college based? No, it's just like a, it's kind of like any, like if you're really good at podcasts, you can put together podcast content and then yeah. you put the price on that. And the it sounds, is that sounds like you to me. Yeah, Udemy. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I pronounce wrongly? I thought you said Academy. Udemy. Right, right, uh, right. Udemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, yeah American great. the American company. Yeah. Uh, I just find this course like a fashion design one to one. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I put 250 pound behind and then by the end of it you knew how to design no i so by the end of that i learned the language the terminology okay. uh, of all the design bases and the, in underwear specific is fashion design actually doesn't really apply here mm -hmm. uh, underwear design specifically called contour design that is an even deeper level yeah, yeah. so from there i take my idea i draw out uh, all the design i wanted just on paper and then i went to uh, different trade shows in paris in turkey and also portugal and then uh, to china just like start to talk about different supplier different manufacturer and if they're not right fit and i will ask them can you introduce me to someone else mm. and after introduction after introduction i find um a small sample rooms in London, which charge incredible amount of money, and the two sample rooms in China, uh, which charge a penny. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I compare the quality. They're actually not that different, mm. especially surprise to me. It's like the quality come from China is actually so much better mm. because they're so professionally doing this for generations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so I decided to go to China, um, start to really establish a relationship with supply chain. And they said, well, your order is too small. We don't work with this. We produce like a million underwear per year. And if you only order of a couple of hundreds, we don't want to deal mm. with you. Um, it's really frustrating because I probably visited over 20 manufacturers. No one really takes small orders seriously yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I end up met in this um, family-run uh, factory. Um, they have a motel. I'm not saying hotel. I'm saying motel. Right. Like right above their manufacturer. And they'll say, well, I'm going to leave here. I'm going to stay here. And uh, I'm going to come to your office every day. And I'm going to chat with you. So I stayed there for two, three months in total. Oh, wow. Okay. Three months? Yeah. Like, well, two months right in that above their factory, sure. or in that mo motel. Uh, the quality was really shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and really, like, I go to work at the same time with them. I sit down there, like, drinking tea with their owners, get to know them. And then I go to speak to the sample, like, a technician, mm. tell their idea. Eventually, I become friends with them. I have dinner with them because they have canteen. Um, and they start to realize that I'm actually quite serious in mm. this business. And they made an exception for me. Wow. That's such an... Uh, that is an interesting story. Okay. And what, what kind of gave you the conviction to follow that through? Because committing to staying with, let's be honest, randomers, right? For, yeah. for two months or three months is quite a... You've got to really have conviction in, in what you're doing for that to make sense. That is after the Kickstarter. So I already have Fine. the money. Yeah, true. And uh, I... Well, there are people who took the money from crowdfunding and then just said, oh, Ibiza never delivered the project. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of yeah. media about it. But I was so honest. I feel obligated yeah, yeah. that people actually buy in the idea. I was overjoyed how popular the idea to become. Mm -hmm. So I was so determined to bring this into life. And that two months, uh, two months spent in that manufacturer and the one month traveling around beforehand was after we gathered all after the campaign was closed. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. And when yeah. you were staying with the family, was it a case where like you get there on day one and you're like, did they know you were coming to stay with them or above no. above them or near them? No. So I was visiting all the manufacturers and got rejected by quite a lot. Mm. And by the time I go to visit this manufacturer, um, they said, oh, do you have a place to stay? Um, I was like, no. Do you have a recommendation? Is that well, we have a hotel up there. Is that yeah, I would check it out. And so you went down every day. But what was it? Like, I mean, in the beginning, you were like, "Hey, this is what I want to do. Can you do it?" And they, yeah. I'm guessing they were like, "No, that's too small for us." Or no, we can't do it. And you just said, "All right, well, I'll see you tomorrow." <laughs> pretty much <laughs> that's like an, that. That's amazing. Yeah, pretty much like that. I was just like, "I'll come back the next day." Yeah. But then what, that's what's so interesting because then what happens, you go back the next day and then they're like, hey, we told you yesterday that we, you're too small for us. So what they actually told me is like, oh, I didn't expect you are still here. And the next day is that like, you're still here. Right. Like, yeah, I'm here. And then I don't see the owner all the time, like the manager all the time. But in that period of time, like they have a client. A, a client manager and they have like someone who's underground in a like a factory manager i just got really close to these people yeah. and telling them i want to do this i want to do this mm. and um at the end these people kind of become my my people mm. and then together they're just having words with the owner here and there just like let's help her like she's serious it's the great like you have to like the whole idea about entrepreneurship is like it teaches you so much to handle no, to mm. actually not take it personally. Deal with re rejection. Yeah. yeah. Classic. Yeah. Classic. Um, so can you talk us through how you actually perfected the sample? Because I think that's also something that people would be quite keen to understand if they're starting any clothing business. Mm -hmm. How did you perfect the sample? You said you went through 30 iterations of it. Yeah, m m more. 16. 16 yeah. Sorry. So what we, what we went through is as I created that mailing list and uh, I... I send them update all the time and that frequency I also have asked them uh, would you like to join a Facebook group okay. like it's at that time Facebook was still popular yeah. okay <laughs> and I create a closed group and I post content uh, frequently to them uh, every time I get a sample back I say, well who would like to get a free sample try so this 
people actually become they receive free sampling frequently yeah they pro as an exchange they provide me feedback and then based on different shape different height different movement they prefer eventually okay. we land on a product that it make everyone's body shape look really great i'm with you yeah so it was your it was your facebook group that was your sort of product fit if you like and kind testing of, testing yeah. what, what worked and what didn't yeah i'm with you okay I've noticed sustainability is quite a big part of your of your brand. Was yeah. that like what what was the sort of thinking behind that? Because I think a, a, one obstacle of sustainability that people come up with in business is they'll say, well, you know, it just makes things so much more expensive to do it sustainably, and that's why yeah. you achieve it. So why was that important to you, and then how did you get around that hurdle? So sustainability is a very close value to my heart because where I grew up, um, I grew up on the border between China and uh, Myanmar. Like our local economy is driven by growing crops and cotton is one of the top things we grow. And when I was a kid, it's like uh, when you grow, you probably don't know like cotton is the most like thirsty plant in the world. Like it take, I, I remember it take like a 50 kilo gram of water or something to produce one kilogram of cotton. Wow. I probably got the number wrong, but the number just like, yeah. so impressively bad. Mm. Um, I always want to do something. I see the kind of first hands of negative impact of growing unsustainable crops that is fitting into everyday people's life versus like uh, how negative impact it could have on the environment in general. Uh, I always want to do something around the social social impact. And that's actually a big part of what I was involved in university time as well. Mm. I think that's I think that's really um I think that's really interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask you because so what what year was this by the way that you were getting the Kickstarter off the ground and everything you were getting ready to launch? Kickstarter is twenty seventeen. So twenty twenty seventeen. Um, and so with uh, what's it been like? Because th- I've noticed more of a revolution in terms of like modern technology underwear companies like there's MeUndies, Tommy John, things like mm. that. What's it been like for you sort of navigating the competitor landscape when there's more companies coming out in the space? You know, doing the sort of high tech certain types of microbial fabric and all this kind yeah. of thing. What's, what's that been like for you? I really respect all these brands who are trying to bring innovative material or innovative design or business model into consumer se- sector. They Both the company you mentioned, I think they're bigger than us because they have been around for over 10 years. Yeah. Um, they are really inspiring in terms of driving consumer to be more aware, to be like express themselves more, more freely. Um, the the way people keep asking me, well, what is the competitive edge for just where? How do you prevent other people copy you or something? My view is we live in a world that is so cheap, so easy to create any product. Uh, it takes like $9 like mm. to make an Apple I, iPhone. Yeah. I think there's a viral video go wrong like nine dollars. I think. Yeah, so. I have. I've yeah. seen that. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. seen that. Wow. And yeah. The whole idea is like a collectively as a innovative startups, we can be better to really take the market share of the big dominated mm. brands in underwear sectors like Calvin Klein or Tommy Figures. Like they are huge, being mm. part of a macro fashion group. Um, I don't see them as a competitor, but more as like challenger brands collectively. Right. We yeah. can take more shares. I really yeah. like that approach. I've never heard that I've philosophy before, that. but I like that. It's like there's the little guys all teaming up against yeah. the big guy, which I like. Yeah, I think people get into this wrong concept. Like they hear this brands maybe doing something similar to you and they feel like really worried, mm. feel like, oh my God, like I need to protect my information, not to let them know. Yeah. Instead, I think we're just so limited. We got scared because of what we know. Mm. Like, we are not scared by common client because they're we're so far away from it. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And we need to jump out of that concept. We need to be more collaborative, sure. especially where the world is heading to. Um, we all together. If you are working on sustainable material, like with a really strong like social impact purpose, like us, mm. then I'd like to work with you rather than seeing you as a competitor. Sure. No, it's an interesting way to look at it, definitely. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on was sort of how you how you set yourself apart in that market that is so saturated and what sort of marketing techniques you've used that has allowed you to get to where you are today. Yeah, that is a, well, 
It's a big question. It's a really <laughs> yeah. big question, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a few things. Um, it all come down to what I covered before. First, you have to have a really amazing product. Yeah. You have you need to have a better product and better service. Like we have a 27 customer service. Do Anytime you? Okay. you drop a message to JustWares, you will get a reply right away. Yeah. Our ticket resolution time is under four hours. That means wow. from the time you send an email to the time like you have a solution, you got answer, your problem you solve is four hours. Yeah. Like, and then the third bit is coming down to how can you generating like content actually relate to people. Mm. And for us, it's really the sense of humor, right? We talked about the tagline yeah, yeah, at the yeah. start, yeah. but that's not trying to be fun funny. That is generally in our DNA, we want to put a smile on people's face. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of attaches people to the brand, doesn't it? Yeah. From from from, from day one. Yeah. I'm with you. And together, this three element differentiate us from other brands. And so, on the social media side, then, how have you how have you pushed the brand from that perspective? Because I feel like a lot of there is so much influencer marketing that comes out now, specifically mm. with clothing brands, because as you say, it's so easy to set up a clothing brand in a way because you find a a manufacturer on Alibaba and you set up a Shopify website and boom, you've kind of set it up in a way. So how do you, yeah, how have you kind of utilized social media marketing to, again, sort of drown out the noise? I have to admit, I'm not the expert in this area. Yeah. Um, why so? Because when I first started out, like uh, I just didn't have the budget working with social media influencers. And um, until like uh, we on board a few like uh, creator or influencer, big influencer in the industry who start to share this experience with me of how they work with mm. other brands that shine uh, some, like kind of see the problem from a different perspective, right? Yeah. And that really helped us to see uh, as a brand, what can what strategy can we put together with the social media? And then what really brought us success, what we have seen in the past couple of years is generating uh, really fun or centered contents. We got a few com uh, like uh, TikTok contents go viral, just like reaching a couple millions reach. And is that your content or is that user generated content? It's our content. Okay. Yeah. So that is nothing you there's no playbook to follow. That's mm. what I learned. Yeah. Uh, it really coming down to constantly iterate content like you can go as crazy as you want or you can go it just need a frequency just like churn as quick as possible with new ideas yeah it's just a numbers game going back to the uh going back to the beginning in terms of funding obviously you had the kickstarter mm. was there any other sort of funds that you were dealing with was it like did you sort of have savings or take any loans or did you seek any funding or was it purely like everything came from from the kickstarter kickstarter was the initial funding to support us to do the manufacturer production and then uh we launched the brand i think in 2018 october uh around that i think half a year after we raised like uh, our first angel uh investment okay uh and the starting from there we every time we hit a revenue like milestone uh we would go out to raise the external funding to um further invest into the growth got you um and i think quite notably uh casper lee who's obviously a really influential guy he's obviously quite notably an investor in, in oh, your business yeah. Yeah. How, how did that come about Funny, he was literally messaging me when I when I came here, right. and he was sharing me another um, viral brand called Liquid, uh, Liquid Water, Li Liquid Death. Oh, Liquid, Liquid Death, yeah, yeah. yeah. They've, they, Death. They, they, they have absolutely they smashed, smashed it. it. Yeah. Which is honestly, if someone had said to me that you could make a two hundred and fifty million dollar company or whatever their the value, of yeah, out of water that yeah. you've got in a can, I yeah. think you're absolutely crazy. Yeah, they have absolutely knocked out the park. Yeah, they really have. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, so what was he saying about Liquid Death? Oh, he would just uh, brainstorming idea with me yeah. of like how can we generate a more creative idea yeah. like yeah. that to achieve uh, uh, viral growth. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. So how did how did Casper's involvement come around? Yeah, I oh that is a good question because a uh, couple of years ago I think when Casper still was a, a YouTuber yeah. at that time um, he was like a twenty two twenty three when he first invested into us so mm. he was super young mm. and around that time like we're already kind of cracking uh, understand the power of leveraging creator and the brand to really get like 
tapped into their audience and also get brands out there. And he was really, he just started doing angel investment because he wanted to be more involved in like interesting brand. And we got introduced through, I think his cousin, um, and we met and then we talked about the brand mission with him. And I so thought, I just love it. Mm. Like literally, he's still saying like, uh, I really love how crazy the brand mm. you have now, but you need to go even crazy, right? Mm. And uh, when we, we were doing fundraising around at that time, that was our first round or second round of Andrew investment. Right. And he wanted to be uh, on board. And uh, that's how we start the conversation. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And how has having Casper on board changed the trajectory of the business well i would not say it's one person could change the yeah, yeah. <laughs> projection like we were so lucky we have a collective like angel investment who come from completely different background okay. we didn't take venture we decided not to take venture money Why was uh, that? to start with because venture is just one organization right yeah and uh, we decided to go down the route of like uh, angel investment i would board on so many crazy people who have incredible background from the top like uh, country manager of one of the biggest app company in the uk mm. to somebody who sold a creative agency f to wwp like we have lots of people who bring different uh, experience into the table and that really benefited us from the early stage of growth because i can reach out to them anytime mm. And um, whenever we have a problem, like Casper introduced us to uh, KSI. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He sent our product to, uh, they're a really good friend. He sent our product to KSI to okay. try it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's just here and there. It's not one person, but collectively as an angel investor, that's where they can add their value to the business to mm. help uh, the business to the next stage. And how did you actually seek? angel investment where do you go to get these angel investors on board because obviously vc firms you can kind of get your head around because you approach each vc firm and yeah. it, that's a numbers game at the end of the day but with angel investors how do you how do you attract angel investors or go about finding angel investors i think my first angel investor come from investment pitch even i have done i think in the early days i went to pretty much every single investment pitch events just yeah. trying to not on not purely looking for investment, but really to build the brand and wellness out there. Um, and then uh, through that kind of brand and wellness, they will say, oh, let's set up a meeting. I want to learn hmm. a little bit. If it's good fit, great. If not, then they tend to, I tend to ask them, like, do you know anyone in this field yeah. who's more, have a bigger interest or more suitable to help us scale? Hmm. Um, and they introduction after introduction, that is where Okay. It come from. So a, net, a net, networking essentially is, is the best way to actually yeah. build up that Absolutely. sort of roster. Yeah. Oh, cool. And also most, I think this would be relevant to your audience as well. Uh, I would say more than half of our angel investors are entrepreneurs themselves. Mm. They really, when they make it, um, they tend to give it back, whether it's money or mm. time or advice. Or, advice yeah, yeah. And that is really valuable. And as you say, when you've got such a variety of people on your board, you get so many different perspectives. Which yeah. You wouldn't get in a VC firm, so I can see that. Yeah, there's definitely a benefit to that, getting different exposures, yeah. different different sort of things that you can leverage rather than just, as you said, the resources of one company. Yeah. Um, what was it like meeting KSI? That's really that's really cool. I never met him. Right, so Casper just made the introduction. Yeah, yeah like, right, right, right. So, so he, sent a, he sent the product to KSI to, actually not just KSI, he has a group. Now, currently, this group of people are uh backer of his fund mm, like right. it's called creator collective or right. okay. see um and it's all of them most of them are actually creator who have a huge uh influence or followers and then they also have the available capital to put together and they do investment now it's a proper fund back to that time it's just a group of his friends and then he would constantly bringing his uh investment into this group Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. there's a few brands like Wild. The have you heard about that? Uh, Was it W Y L D? W I L D. W I L D. Yeah, they're a natural duodo. Okay. Yeah, they're Nothing, growing yeah. massive. Are they? Okay. I think I have. I think I have. I have. Yeah. There was another brand. Was it Native? 
Do you know oh, Native? Yeah, that they were exactly yeah. the same. They were a sort of a, a, a completely natural deodorant brand. Yeah. And they, it was Moe's Alley who founded that, and he sold it right. within two years for about $100 million. Whoa. From starting it from nothing. Yeah. I remember reading about Native, and that was a really impressive he story. He has a podcast I follow, which you really Moe's? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Interesting. But no, I do, yeah, I know about that story. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any plans to, uh, to expand from underwear into other different types of sort of like socks or pajamas, things like that? Or is it like you want to be niche and specialize in like, we do underwear best, that's what we that's what we do. We do underwear best, and uh, whoever want to shop looking for better fit underwear, they should come to us. But in the meantime, we want to really bring more innovative product into other basic category as well. We want to be the brand for every man to go to shop their comfortable premium basics. Mm. What I wanted to also touch on was some of the challenges that you've faced sure. getting to kind of where you are today. What's been some of the, the hardest moments of the business? Do you mean I just got my first investment, hired the team, and uh, I was given seven days notice to leave the country because of something my like that would rejected. probably spring to mind yeah it might yeah, yeah that could probably be something along those lines yeah 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 how did you deal with that, that was true. <laughs> yeah, okay really yeah i was given seven days notice to leave the country yeah when my visa renewal was rejected okay and if i didn't leave within seven days um you'd get deported would you you either point? get deported or if you got you basically have no identity in the country wow okay how did you navigate that yeah because I, I can't imagine our, our system is geared towards people getting that done in seven days. So yeah. how did you sort that? I left. Ah. <laughs> oh, that's one option. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I actually just left. Yeah. Okay. No, so it was really stressful. Um, I can imagine. Um, I had to, I have to dismiss the whole team right away after I hired them. Oh, wow. Oh, made a promise. Okay. Uh, of how we're gonna grow the business. Yeah. Oh, that's awful. Uh, I was kicked out of my uh, flat because I don't have a valid uh, yeah. visa to legally continue yeah. the rent. I put everything I have into a storage, hoping that I will be able to find another visa to come back. Yeah. Um, I also have to sit down with all the investor. I just raised money from to expand the situation and. Uh, not trying to make it ba sound better, but being very realistic. And frank. And frank to yeah. expand the situation and where I see the risk, where I see uh, the opportunity. I'm with you. Um, so what point was this then? You say you just raised investment. 2018, literally. Wow. Okay. All that hard work. Yeah. Until 2018, okay. Yeah. And just taken away from you. Yeah, so we were, so I was talking about, we got a Kickstarter campaign done in 2017, uh, August. Yeah. Uh, I was supposed to launch the brand in Q1, August. Yeah. I got a rejection letter in, I think, May or June. Wow. I think June, around okay. that time. So God. I hired the team prepping for the launch. Of course, yeah. Everything got delayed for sure. Yeah. But then the hardest decision is I just, I can't keep you yeah, of course. because that I don't must, know yeah, if I can come back yeah, or yeah. not. And yeah. so what happened after that then? I left in a rush, which you can imagine. And uh, I went back to China where my parents uh, live now yep. and tried to figure out a new type of visa to, to come back to UK and emailed every single investor, advisor, friends to mm. see how can you help me to come back? Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. And uh, thankfully, uh, Tech Nation has this visa called uh, uh, Exceptional Talents Visa. It's part of like a, um, like a UK immigration system. They will, they have the quota, at that time it's 200 like uh, per year. They can write a reference letter okay. uh, to UK immigration department to recommend people. Fun. Uh, but you have to fit really tough. I, I bet, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and thanks for that scheme, yeah. um, I managed to get a new visa to come back. And so how did you pick the business up from nothing then when you came back? Oh, wow. Um, I was actually living in my office for a while. I have never told anyone yet, but around that time, like it was just so tough. Mm. Um, 
I could not even rent a place because I had this uh, blank period of time on my visa. I just don't have a credit mm. uh, history to do that because I'm not paying myself. If you rent somewhere, you need to do the reference check. Of course, you need yeah, a, I'm with you. You need a pay yeah. a bill, a pay slip. I didn't have that. Um, it's really about, I guess it's a belief in the business. And also, I'm all... I feel so strongly to fulfill my promise. Like people believe they in me, whether it's the early stage backers to our investors, mm. to the friends and the, whoever helped me to come back to the country. I just want to prove that I'm worth your belief. I'm, I can do this. What would you say were the kind of main takeaways going through that period or the key learning points? Because going through something like that must be incredibly stressful and you know just exhausting emotionally <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. but understandably if you're going through something like that right i mean yeah what, what did you what did you take away from that that period i honestly think when i look back um i think everyone will have adversity to face everyone will have yeah. a challenge yeah. time but you never know how strong you are until you handled you overcome the situation and that is something that i feel incredibly grateful for mm -hmm. like it was a really tough situation i cried i stressed like mm. i went through a lot of emotional feeling but looking back sitting where i am now i really proud i'm really proud that i overcome that adversity rather than let then run over me it's extremely impressive a really, a really impressive story. I was just sort of no, that is. in silence just while you talk. I mean, that's yeah, really no, it is. No, it I mean, is. we've had people that have had all sorts of kind of hurdles in their business, but I mean, to literally be deported after you've just raised in the funding, run up to launch in the run business. up to launch after yeah. just raising funding and hiring a team. I know. I mean, that I I can't even imagine how you cope with that. No, like, my hat goes off to you. Seriously, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, wow, that's I've forgotten my next question. That's, that's yeah, completely I know. That's, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I mean. I don't, not to kind of like probe into that too much, but mm -hmm. what do you think allowed you to keep keep going when obviously a lot of people in that position would wouldn't be able to take it? Was it was it just that determination not to let down your investors and actually prove a point to either yourself or to them, or was there some sort of some something else kind of driving you at that point? I just don't think I was ready to give up. Yeah, I think it's so hard to get to where I was at that point. I put so much effort to get to get back mm. to the country. Yeah. This is not the point where I should say no. Mm. Like it's not really about proving to the investor. Um I think it's about proving to myself. Yeah. When did you know uh, or sort of decide or how did you make the decision rather to uh, to start taking money out of the business? I think that's a question a lot of founders have. Like when do you start paying yourself and why? And how do you gauge how much as well? Yeah, so I started properly. Well, I stopped taking like a minimum salary uh, just so that I can get a lease yeah. when I come back. Yeah, yeah. That's really practical speaking. Uh, I start to take the proper salary still below the market rates, but um, enough for me to carry my uh, cover my day-to-day -day expense i think after we start to do a uh, probably uh five figures like a monthly revenue mm -hmm. um and then as we grow bigger and bigger then i inc gradually increased my salary but i think it's a what i learned so for probably two and a half years i feel really guilty to take salary out of the business because i feel like that is taking away the opportunity for me to grow the business. Mm, it's but, a balance. But I hit one point, like when I couldn't find a lease, when I couldn't really uh, like cover the basic of my life while I'm working on this passion, um, it stressed me so much, actually become a, a distraction for running the business. And that is learning I had is when I have to be in a position that I don't need to worry the basic to be able to take bolder decisions with the business. And that is probably a lip, a, mm. a lean, lean in f moment for me to feel more comfortable mm. of taking salary. Did you always know you were going to be an entrepreneur? No. 
Did you always want to be? I want to create something. Right. Uh, whether it's a project or business, I what I enjoy most is the tangibility. Mm. And creating a business give me that tangible feeling of creating a product and seeing customer put a smile on customer face, receiving an email from customer to say, oh my God, this is game changer. It saved my whole entire life. That kind of moment is a tangible value. Mm. I can feel, I can see, I can carry it on. And uh, in terms of your family, were they sort of encouraging of you starting a business or were they more sort of, you know, security, you've got a great job, stick to that, you know? Well, my mom, I was home first time after three years of lockdown this December. The first thing my mom asked me is, are you going to get a job? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. that. Answer your question. I love that's, that. That's perfect. Okay. That's the best answer to the question that we could have had. <laughs> <It's> just, uh, <laughs> I are have you, a are job. you done yet? Yeah. Uh, I'm paying people. I'm yeah, hiring yeah. people. <laughs> Got it. What's, Got something, it. what's something that you, wish, uh, that you wish you would have maybe known when you were coming up? when you're building the business? Mm, it is a much longer, tougher journey than it looks. And then off the back of that, if you could have done something differently, what would you have done? Mm. Many people ask me this question and I have an answer different time. Mm. But if I could have done something differently, I think I will raise money earlier. Interesting. Like I will strategically go out to raise a bigger, yeah. larger round and not worry about that anymore. On on that note, actually, mm -hmm. how how did you value the business to start with? When you're ra when you're going out raising investment, because obviously you see it on Dragon Stand a lot of the time, and they get the valuations completely out of kilter with the with the business. Yeah. So we were on Dragon Stand, you know that. What year were you on Dragon Stand? Twenty twenty. Really? Yeah. Okay. How did it go? We got two offers. Okay. And we rejected that. Okay. Was that after the show, or was it on on no, the on the show? On the on show, the show was it? Yeah, okay, yeah. fine. What's what stopped you from taking the dragons on? Oh, the valuation, the valuation is too bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. It's way below the valuation they provided is below our revenue at that time. Right. I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So it's not a failed deal. Yeah. Uh, and I think that coming down to we always run business very transparently with every shareholder. Uh, we don't want unfairness against minority. Mm. Did you go on Dragon's Den for the publicity knowing you weren't gonna take the offer or were you going into it thinking, if the offer's good enough, we will take it? The later, right, yeah. Because yeah. when we first got the email, they reached out to us when we first got the email, we saw it was spam. So we haven't, we, we actually didn't respond for probably a few months until Michael found this out. Well, Maybe that's mm. just, there's no downside of replying. Mm. Yeah, we genuinely was thinking about like if there's a right fit, then we should do it. Wow, I'm with you. And so, go on. No, I was just gonna say, who were the two dragons that made you offers? Uh, one is Tuka Solomon. Yeah. yeah. Another one is the Taj Navani. Right. He's, okay. Yeah, he's replaced by uh, Stephen, Stephen Bartlett. Bartlett. Yeah, yeah, Stephen Bartlett. Okay, interesting. And so what um what's the plan for the business moving forward then from here? Well, we are having really exciting uh product launch coming up this June. Okay. And uh, we are going to a different territory beyond the UK. Okay. So we're both very excited about the opportunity. Uh, exciting. Can yeah. you tell us where you're looking to launch a product yet? Or is that still hush hush? Uh, hush hush. Is it? For now, yeah. Fine, fine. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I've been, I forgot to mention, I mean, I've been on the hunt for the perfect underwear. We had this conversation. We I have. literally remember having this conversation. You with remember? You. I do remember having this conversation with you because I had exactly the same issue. Yes. And I still haven't found a suitable alternative. Neither and now, I. clearly I we need to try it. I'm really excited right? to try Just Wear. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and this isn't me, I promise I'm not saying this. Yeah, that, that actually sounded really loaded. It, it was, sounded like it's like, I've been looking for the <laughs> I genuinely, I had a, I had a rant about this in the pub with him like a year ago, and I was like, I'm really frustrated because I have like two or three all right pairs, and I have some, from, yeah. and they're all kind of similar, but they're all like they're all just not what Saggy. I want. Yeah, or, and I'm yeah. I'm just really yeah. specific with yeah. things like that. It really bugs me, and I just want to have one pair that's perfect, and then buy ten of them, and then forget about it. Yeah. A brand that you can just go, a to. brand that I can just yeah. go to, 
and I've and I've tried like a couple of you know your competitors and you know it didn't go very well yeah. and so now I'm like <laughs> but now now that I'm aware like I'm actually keen I, I'm I really want to try I really want to try the just wears well give a try and you will never regret it I bet it absolutely yeah. and don't tell me how you feel tell me what your date tell you okay yeah what optimistic <laughs> we love that <laughs> i like that that's the best that's the best response you can get right I'll give it a feedback yeah exactly yeah. no i'm actually i'm really excited to try it well the I valentine they just passed so. i know yeah true i know yeah true could have got like a valentine's day like coupon code <laughs> <laughs> you need yeah. to find the opportunity to impress another one let's do it yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. i will help you <laughs> okay. i love that yeah. good um just as we uh just as we wrap up uh we like to ask our guests the same question at the end of every interview true. um which is that obviously you know we've asked quite practical questions we like to get down to the nitty-gritty so for everyone listening at home that might have already started a business or they're thinking about starting one there was one piece of practical advice that you could give uh you know less on the kind of motivational inspiring side and more on the real sort of practical actionable stuff mm. um what would you what would you say learn understand your numbers okay understand your number and have a proper um accounting setup from day one it would benefit you huge because a lot of people like doing business mm. but if you're not clear with your number then a lot of work just go wasted. Right. Very good piece of advice. Very practical. Very good piece That's what it says in the tin. Exactly. I love that. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. This has been such an amazing conversation. Yeah, no, it really has. Um, do you want to really let, let people know where they can find you or find the company? Absolutely. If you want to get the most comfortable underwear to look after your balls, then go to www.just-wears.com. J-U-S-T-W-E-A-R-S. Just Wears. Just wears, you heard it first. I'm going to get myself a pair and I can't <laughs> wait. It's going to be great. Uh, guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, as always, make sure to hit subscribe, turn on post notifications uh, so that you know whenever we've got something coming up. And uh, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, then do us a favor, rate us five stars. And, uh, and if you enjoyed it, leave a review and let us know what you liked. And we will see you in the next one. Yang, thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Lovely.